looking, still looking. He is going deep down the far side of the field, and it is incomplete. The game is over. And the Jets deserve this win. The things that inspire me, the things that inspire me, the, the people in my life, y'all inspire the out of everybody in this league. Every single play, the way the resolve, the fight, defense going out there, pitch a fucking shutout in the second half. Jake has it away. He has the distance, and it is no good. Jake Moody missed the kick, and the 49ers lose. The fight from this locker room, from pregame to the end of the game, the fight from this locker room. Guys, if we weren't to be the night today, we were not, right? Fantasy Football Happy Hour with Matthew Berry, served by Applebee's. Welcome to the Fantasy Football Happy Hour, the day after the fall of the undefeated teams. The Eagles and the Niners go down against those scrappy Jets and Browns. I'm Connor Rogers alongside Matthew Berry, Jay Croucher. A uh, kind of grinded out two games there, guys, but some wild finishes. Uh, look. Sometimes you don't have your best stuff, but you just got to grind it out. Like, you know what? I mean, I've said that many times to, to my wife, and I feel like that's what happened in the NFL this past Sunday. Let's be clear. You know who drinks free today? Jay Croucher. Who drinks free, Matthew? I'll tell you who drinks free. Connor Rogers and all of the beleaguered Jets fans. It's been a tough year. I notice you have broken out the Sauce Gardner jersey. <laughs> Finally, once this year, it's for the first time you've actually done it here. This is Connor last night, right here. He's back. He's so effing back. Um, a lot of congratulating Connor on the text thread last night for the show. What about what about me? Yeah. <laughs> long, they long forgot long, that you were actually yeah. a long, yeah. lifelong, yeah. lifelong yes. Jets fan exactly. until Rogers went down, and then you're off the bandwagon. Nope. But now you're back on. <laughs> well, no, he's, he's how I'm a lifelong Jets fan. When Rogers signed, I was like, ah, I don't really want to deal with this anymore. Yeah. I'm off. When Rogers went down, back. now I'm back. Now you're back I love in. Got Jets. It. Jets. It's hard to keep track of where you are <laughs> at any given time in your yeah. fandom. Bold strategy, though, when to join us again. <laughs> yeah. It worked out for you, shockingly. But yeah. bold strategy. But look. Uh, how excited are you? I mean, finally, so for people who don't know, obviously, Connor, in addition to his day job here, you uh, you do the uh, the pre and post game for SNY. You host a Jets podcast. What's it called again? Badlands. Badlands. Yep. It's called Badlands. Not the Springsteen song. Yep. But, but an they, ode to Bruce. We are an ode to Bruce. It was born and in they, Jersey, this and podcast. Believe, and they totally have the rights to use it. Yes. It's definitely licensed, <laughs> yeah. for sure. They've We're definitely fine. got a whole deal with uh, Springsteen. Incorporated. Um, but anyway, you're sort of a lifelong Jets fan, and you're all in professionally, personally. Biggest, where does this rank for you in terms of Jets victories? I, I called it the gutsiest win I've ever seen from them. Okay. Right? Wow. I mean, they go into this game with they lost their best offensive lineman last week in Elijah Vera Tucker. Yep. They go into this game with really no starting corners, no Sauce Gardner, no DJ Reed, mm -hmm. no Brandon Eccles, so the backups were hurt. Um, you know, they're obviously without Aaron Rodgers, no Doug. Garrett Wilson is dealing with, thanks to the MetLife turf, dealing with a bad ankle right. throughout the entire game. It feels like you're just sitting there and you're going, what more can go wrong? Oh, and then their rookie guard, Joe Tippmann, who's been great this year, he goes out for the rest of the game. And to beat the Eagles, who ha were undefeated, had yeah. some signs of, you know, flaws this year compared to where they were last year, you go to the bye three and three without Aaron Rodgers, with Zach Wilson, and that is exciting. And we talked, we, we talked about this kind of when Aaron Rodgers went down, which is just, We'll get into fantasy here in one second, but I will just say that, like, I think I said this because I, I did a lot of interviews as well around, like, what's this mean, you know, yeah. uh, for Rodgers and the and the Jets and everything like that. I'm like, look, their schedule, the first six games are brutal. And Robert Sala talked about that uh, uh, even with Rodgers. Like, well, I want to get through these first six games. And I was like, like, if you guys can get through these first six games with Zach Wilson just sort of Brock purdying it, you know, like just sort of like uh, don't lose it. You don't need to win the game for us. You can exactly. run the ball well. You can play good defense, but just don't lose the game for us. If you guys get out of this at three and three, like I think you're sitting pretty. And so it didn't happen the exact way we thought. Right. It was a lot of peaks and valleys right. along the way. And if you'd asked me which of the three games you guys win, I would probably wouldn't have picked. <laughs> Bills, uh, Bills, Eagles. Broncos, and Eagles would be the three that you guys would be victorious in. Um, the Patriots feel like that's a game you probably right. should have won. Especially that one? looking yeah. back at, but uh, but you guys head into the bye at three and three, and you got to feel pretty good. And I think fantasy wise, we'll get into this here in a little bit. But I think you feel good about 
Brees Hall and Garrett Wilson, the Jets offensive players that you care about. Yep, schedule eases up as well. And it's funny that you say that like that was the gutsiest win because to me, maybe the gutsiest win was week one this year against right. Buffalo. But that win was so colored by Aaron Rodgers where I think all Jets fans felt bad the next day, even yeah, though it was yep. such a momentous win. Now this one, there's no taint on it. Like it was just an incredible win. Now the season is alive. Yeah, the season's alive. And Jay, we were talking before the show started, you know, Robert Sala, it's a long road to be the coach of the year because there are so many great stories this year, like Dan Campbell, like Mike McDaniel. But when you look at it, Robert Ron Sala, Rivera. Ro <laughs> Ron Rivera, of course, just hovering around. Josh McDaniel. Yes, yes, <laughs> Arthur, exactly. Arthur Smith. All yeah. of the great stories. <laughs> It's incredible. The guy takes a lot in the New York media. He really, really does. And if you said that Aaron Rodgers would go down four plays into his season and they'd be three and three at the bye with Zach Wilson, uh, a big shout out to Robert Sala. What did you think when Brace ran into the end zone? Oh, we were <laughs> devastated. We were devastated on the desk. Like, Two minutes for the Eagles right. offense. Take The Eagles we let had, them score. We're all over the place. But we, we actually had this – we had a long debate in the football night in America um, – uh, set there we were talking about this and and me and coach Garrett and Deb McCord and everything like that and we were, we were talking about this and I just it, it, it was kind of split down the middle because some are like yeah yeah you got to take a knee and you got to run that you got to run it out and but but if you start doing the math even if they they run two plays immediate timeout they had two timeouts left the Eagles did right and then you run down the third play and then you've got to kick the kick the field goal right um then you're still with like 40, 45 seconds left because it was like 149. And so the, the argument goes, like, are you better off doing that and kicking a field goal with like f and giving the ball back to the Eagles with like 40 seconds left and all they have to do is get to in place of a 60-yard field goal because that's Jake Elliott's range. Yeah. Jake Elliott can make a 60-yard field goal in theory, right? Or are you better off going, making them score a touchdown with what ended up happening a minute and a half in a game in which your defense has stopped them all game long? That's yep. the key. And they pitched a shutout in the second half. Yep. Last thing, and then we can move on, because I do think this is fascinating. So I was someone who I very much needed the Eagles to lose yesterday for right. financial reasons and also emotionally because I'm a diehard Jets fan. But as it was <laughs> and happening... And your emotions are tied to your yeah, yeah, they exactly. go hand in hand. <laughs> exactly. But as it was happening in real time, the general rule is if a team is letting you score, you probably shouldn't score because right. they're letting you do it for a reason. But at the same time, I agree. Just with the way the Jets' defense was playing, I was happier with a four- or six-point lead and the Eagles having time and timeouts than only you know, 40 seconds and driving down the field. I was happy with the touchdown in that spot. And then the Jets defense, I think, rewarded that. Yeah, I just, I just think it was it was going to be tougher for the Eagles to score a touchdown. That's the key. I, like, the, to me, the argument is, and I know I'm sort of on the wrong side of this. I think most people feel like it was a mistake to, that Bree should have taken the knee and yeah, gone down. Yeah, I moved after. I right. changed my mind. I was like, you know what? They hadn't scored that half. It right. was a big well, ass. And, that's, and I'm just saying, like, I think it is – I think almost, I know this is going to sound insane, I think time becomes irrelevant. And that, in this meaning that, like, they were going to have enough time to either get in, in place for a field goal or have enough time to get down to take a shot at the end zone. And just, I think it's easier to stop them from scoring a touchdown than it is to stop them from scoring a field goal the way the defense had played yeah. that game so far. You know, That's my argument. And the Jets made you look right. At the end True. of the day. Here's what I would have done, and no one's ever done this. I don't think anyone will ever do this. If I was Brace, I would have taken a knee at the one, get them to call timeout, and then you try and run it in from there. You get them to burn timeouts, time. and then you're, like, splitting the difference. But, like, that's just never going to happen. But yeah, so I do it, think it is, that's, that, that's that might is, be mathematically that is, the best part. That is interesting, yeah. Whether if they ran it twice or if he just took a knee the second time, made them yep. call out, and then you try to score yep. on the third one. Yeah. Andrew, anyway, let's jump into the Roto World player news. And with that, we will put a bow on this game, guys, before we move to San Francisco and Cleveland. And Brees Hall, 12 carries, 39 yards, one touchdown where he was allowed to score. It all counts the same in fantasy. And here's the thing, Matthew, the five catches for 54 yards were really the big note here for Brees Hall on the day. Highest snap share in a game this season. He played almost 70% of the snaps. It is a season high in both receptions and receiving yards. To your point here, Connor, look, for his career, and I know it's only a year and a half old, but for his career, when this kid sees 15 or more touches, he's averaging 22.5 fantasy points per game. Was he helped out by the gimme touchdown? Sure, sure he was. But you know what? He also caught, uh, caught the two-point conversion there. Um, oh, sorry, that was Randall Cobb, uh, but should have been him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, all Jets fans agree with you, by the way. <laughs> it should have been uh. him. Uh, but the, the, the fact is, is that he has played very, very well. When this kid gets work, he produces. The usage in the passing game is certainly very encouraging as well. And then to the point, 
like as we just talked about, like this schedule, like it's been a brutal schedule for six weeks, but now they have a bye, they have a full week, rest, get even healthier, and then look at their schedule coming out the rest of the way. Giants, Chargers, at Las Vegas, and at Buffalo, which by the way, you know, Buffalo doesn't look like they did, uh, you know, we'll talk about Buffalo here in a second, but this is a team they beat. And he, know, ran, and, well and he ran well against Buffalo. He ran well against Buffalo as well. So. I feel like Brees Hall is kind of a borderline RB1 the rest of the way. Yep. Firstly, amazing effort from Terrell Edmonds to fake tackle Brees Hall to lull him into the end zone, which I loved, uh, the Eagles' safety. I yep. think that the two most important stats for Brees Hall out of this game, Dalvin Cook three carries, Dalvin Cook one target. Dalvin Cook is not part not of this offense anymore. No. It's entirely... We talk preseason about when would it flip to Brees and would it still be 60-40? Well, I think it's flipped to him more quickly than anyone expected. And it's not 60-40. It's like 85-15 at this point. Quick question for you. Who gets back on the field in a significant way sooner? Dalvin Cook or Aaron Rodgers? <laughs> Because you guys saw the video. Aaron Rodgers walking around. He was on the field pregame throwing balls, no no crutches, no. some sort of crazy ayahuasca. I don't know what's going on <laughs> he's in that guy's yeah. body, but, like, he's some sort of, you know, physical modern miracle over here. Yeah, Aaron Rodgers actually injected ayahuasca into his ankle, and it's repaired his Achilles. Whatever it's the first you time told me. coming back I, after the bye. I, yeah. I would believe whatever you told me, uh -huh. you know, because he's an interesting dude. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. But, um, but I mean, like. Five weeks after tearing his Achilles, he's literally Stop standing up without crutches and throwing a football. He thinks he's playing this year. Yeah. So the answer to your question might be Aaron Rodgers because Dalvin Cook is never giving the Jets anything. <laughs> yeah. And and by the way, like, I'll just tell you this. Like, again, I know people have varying opinions of, of Aaron Rodgers for a variety of reasons, and I get all of them. But I'll say this specifically about that guy. Like, there, if there's ever a guy in the NFL you don't want to doubt, it's Aaron Rodgers. If Aaron Rodgers says he's playing this year – I'm betting on that. I'm, I don't like betting against Aaron Rodgers. When you bet against Aaron, I think you lose. Jay, on the other side of this game for the Eagles pass catchers, the Jets suiting up a couple practice squad cornerbacks, and A.J. Brown clearly took advantage. Seven catches on ten targets for 131 <laughs> yards. But a more quiet day for Devontae Smith and a dreadful uh. drop in this game that I've never seen all the years I've watched Devontae Smith from college to the pros. He did not look right at all in this one. No, I think he was just a little bit rattled maybe by his recent form. But the fact that he got 11 targets, the fact that he had the drop, like he will be fine. I'm not worried about right. Devontae Smith. AJ Brown is just quietly an absolute monster this season yeah. after the concerns about him early and getting upset on the sideline. I mean, he's been a top five wide receiver in the NFL pretty clearly. It's just Jalen Hurts, this isn't right, Matthew. How do you feel? You abandoned him as your ride or die, and now all of a sudden he's kind of, abandoned. he hasn't melted, no, but no, no, he's hang not on, been no. very good. Yeah, uh, I think he hasn't, he's been inconsistent NFL-wise. Fantasy-wise, he's been yeah. fine. I mean, again, so many quarterbacks were brutal yesterday. Scoring was down across the NFL, both fantasy and real-life NFL. Uh, you say I'm not worried at all about Devontae Smith. I'm worried a little bit. Look, I'm encouraged by the 11 targets. I'm encouraged by the fact that they tried to get him involved early. He did catch a reception on the first drive. That cash is for me in Penn State, Blake. We've been riding that all nice. season long in terms of the Eagles figuring out where they need to show some love early on and, and catching reception. So we appreciate that. But he's now been under 50 receiving yards in four or six games so far this season. Single digit fantasy points in three or four. And I agree with you. The narrative changes if he comes down with that ball. I mean, again, there were there were definitely some big plays. I feel like he, he also there was a pass interference as well. That, um, But I'll say that I think coming into the season, the narrative was, and this is one that I echoed, so I'll own this, was just like, you know, it's 1A and 1B. You know, you prefer A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, but not by much. And there's basically a round difference between the two of them, you know, and that these were guys that, like, from, like, week two on last year were basically the same fantasy wide receiver. And so there was, you know, wasn't a ton. We preferred A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, but not by much. I will just say that now I do feel like there is a clear number one. It's A.J. Brown. He's a locked-in wide receiver one. And Devontae Smith is like a wide receiver three with some, you know, who's getting decent targets on a good offense. But, like... There's a clear separation between those two now. Yeah, what I would say is that his Philly schedule upcoming, Miami, Washington, Dallas, Kansas City, Buffalo, San Francisco, Dallas, Seattle. That's completely insane. That's the hardest stretch that any team yeah. left to play this season. And I think that is actually good for Devontae Smith's fantasy value because they're not going to be able to do the thing where they just play ball control and run it for 40 minutes. They're going to have to be throwing. And in games that they're not, they're playing bad secondaries like Washington's, uh, Miami's upcoming. I think Devontae yeah. Smith is going to get more volume and he'll be fine.
All right, let's move over to the other game we opened with here, and that was the 49ers. They suffered their first loss on the road against the yeah. Browns. And the biggest news on this one is not Christian McCaffrey's stat line, which was only 11 carries for 43 yards, three catches for nine yards, and he did have a touchdown. But he left the game early with the oblique injury and did not return. Kyle Shanahan, after the game, did not know the severity of this injury, Matthew. Why can't we have nice things? Why can't we have nice things, Connor Rogers? Every fantasy star this year. Why can't we have Tyreek nice Hill better watch out? Yeah, I he's know. the only guy, and he was cramping as Him well. Him and Chase, the two first rounders, where you're like, oh. All right. So, as of this taping, uh, we don't know what their schedule is, right? Oh, so we don't know the severity of the injury. He could be fine, he could be not. Adding to the concern here is that their game next week is Minnesota, it's the Monday night game. So, this is, which is on the one hand, it's positive. Oh, good, there's an extra day for McCaffrey to get right. But it's also like for fantasy managers, like just so you know, you're going to have to go into Sunday morning making lineup decisions, a week in which there are six teams on a bye. We are, we are entering into Bimageddon, just so you guys know, right? You probably haven't, you know, you're still wrapping your head around week six, so you haven't started thinking about week seven. But week seven is Bimageddon, six teams are on a bye, and then you've got all these injured guys, and so you're going to have to make decisions. So we will talk more about this tomorrow uh, hopefully we'll have more clarity on McCaffrey's injury when we do the waiver wire show tomorrow and we'll talk about this but I'll just say that Jordan Mason played well it was Elijah Mitchell's first game back my expectation is it would be a bit of a committee I don't think either one gets the full CMC workload here but the other part of it here is is that I would say like well if CMC is out I think you'll see some Jordan Mason you'll see some Elijah Mitchell and you'll see some Debo Samuel Jay but then Debo Samuel also gets hurt in this game yeah, and that seemed a little bit more concerning because at least McCaffrey got hurt and then he came back in, tried to give it a go, clearly didn't feel right, and then he was yeah. done for the rest of the game. Samuel was ruled out with the shoulder injury. It didn't look too severe, and I think the reporting has been that it's not expected to be too bad. But what I would worry about with these two guys for fantasy purposes is that the Niners, they play the Vikings, then it's Cincinnati, and then they have their bye week. So if they want to give these guys two weeks, I think the Eagles losing yesterday was also gives the Niners a bit more wiggle room. They're the clear favorites to get the one seed. Also, I don't really understand why they had CMC on track for 400 carries right. in this offense, and that's what he was doing. So I would expect that probably not going to see these guys on Monday night, but it's a wait and see. There's no, no clarity yet. Yeah. Jay, maybe the worst game we've seen from Brock Purdy in this one, 12-27, 125 yards and one touchdown and an interception. He had three carries for seven yards. I mean, this is what Jim Schwartz's Browns defense is going to do to a lot of quarterbacks, and it felt like it was magnified with the loss of Debo and CMC in this game for Brock Purdy. Yeah, look, there's no bigger Brock Purdy supporter than I, uh, trying to ride the 25-1 to MVP ticket home, but Purdy was terrible yesterday, and I thought the stat line flattered him. And the stat line I agree. was terrible. He could have had four picks yeah. yesterday, and the irony is, is that the, the narrative would have been, had Jake Moody made that 41-yarder, that Purdy led them down the field. Purdy threw a pick on the first play yep. of the drive and yeah. just wasn't yep. caught. He was not good yesterday. It felt like just with the conditions, with the wind and the rain, he couldn't grip the ball for a time in the second quarter. It just wasn't happening. And the Browns have the best defense in the league, perhaps that, by margin. I think that's the key thing is that Debo going out, CMC going out, Trent Williams also came out. Yes. And the fact he came that, back in at least. But, like, but right, I mean, so that's the thing. You're... In fairness to Brock Purdy, right, you're on the road against one of, if not the best defense in the NFL. You lose your starting left tackle. You use your best running back. You lose one of your key wide receivers as well. It's windy. It's cold. I'm not... Yeah, I'm not ready to bail on Brock Purdy for one bad game. He'll be fine. And also, he just had the best game of his career like eight days ago. Yeah. So he will be fine. I think the Debo going out really shook up their offense in a weird way because just the way that he runs across the formation, they tried to use Ray Ray McLeod, yes. and then Ray Ray McLeod was running the wrong direction it, across it the formation. It looked like a disaster. Like false yeah. It's a bit of a mess. Yeah, Ray Ray McLeod, he was kind of thrusted into the Debo <laughs> role, and there's one Debo Samuel. Yes. So. Yeah, I mean, this offense without Mc... I mean, I will say this. This would help your... Co if If... Debo and McCaffrey both miss Monday night against the Vikings and Brock Purdy goes out plays well and they beat Minnesota which I think they can easily do and Brock Purdy plays well with you know a full week and a day to get ready for that um, I think that actually helps Purdy's MVP argument because he'll have done it without the two big stars because that's always the the anti Purdy argument is it's like well anyone could do it if they had all those stars and that coach yeah I'm off Purdy. I'm on to Mahomes MVP now. <laughs> there we go. Wow. <laughs> really? Yeah. Have, you, have you considered Sam Howell? <laughs> yeah, I considered him and I put him in the bin. Right. <laughs> there you go. Mahomes. You still have Patrick Mahomes. Too All right, big. fair enough.
On the Brown side, PJ Walker had to start this game with Deshaun Watson hurt. Not the prettiest stat line, 18 to 32, 192 yards and two touchdowns. But more importantly, Jay, he keeps Amari Cooper afloat in fantasy. Amari Cooper catches four of his eight targets, most importantly for 108 yards. Yeah, incredible 58 yard reception from Amari Cooper. Yeah. Amari Cooper just remains the most underrated player in the NFL. He might be. I feel like no one ever gives him any love. Also, that was interesting that Jerome Ford was able to have a really solid day, 17 for 84, even though the Niners were loading up their defense. Look, PJ Walker, uh, I don't think anyone's ready to move on from Deshaun Watson after PJ Walker, who tried to give the game away uh, on the, the drive where the Browns ultimately won it. And it was funny because after he threw the ball on second down, Kevin Stefanski was like, All right, not only do you not get to do anything on third down, no one gets to do anything. Kareem Hunt, you run slowly up the middle and get tackled. <laughs> yep. This is effectively a kneel. You're not allowed to run left or right, just straight up the middle. Uh, but I think that Ford and Cooper having good days was a great sign for them. I mean, Ford forward. got 19 touches in this game. Kareem Hunt got 15. I mean, they just they tried to hide P.J. Yeah. Walker. I mean, so just volume there. So Kareem Hunt, sort of interesting here. He also gets the rushing touchdown as well. But to your point, this was as good a game as we've seen from Jerome Ford since he became the starter. So that worked out well. Didn't expect this, obviously. So, yeah, the Browns as a whole, like, give credit where credit is due. Like, Stefanski and Jim Schwartz coached him up. They came out to play. They produced. Amari Cooper gets locked in as a top 20 wide receiver. Look, he's had a 24% target share in four to five games this year. And remember, he's had games with Watson, DTR, and now P.J. Walker. He seems to be quarterback proof. Yep. Browns win that division. They're plus 265 on DraftKings. they got the easiest schedule of anyone. I think they'll win that division. Yeah, it feels like the other teams, too, just aren't right in a lot of ways, even when they win. Yeah, just we'll get to the Bengals we'll get to at it. some point, but they don't, they don't look great. Yeah, All right. they do not. Uh, Jacksonville with a big win over the Colts in a Gardner Minshew revenge game situation that did not work out in that fashion. Mm -hmm. But from a fantasy perspective, Matthew, more importantly, is the Colts' backfield. Jonathan Taylor, eight carries, 19 yards. Zach Moss, seven carries, 21 yards, and a touchdown. They each catch at least five passes. So a good day um, through the air for these guys. But I think the point remains that Zach Moss isn't going away anytime soon. And this looked like a 50-50 share yesterday. 13 touches for each of them. We, you know, we do a thing on fantasy football pregame, you know, bar trivia, where, you know, we answer tomorrow's trivia today. And one of the questions was, who gets more touches, Jonathan Taylor or Zach Moss? I chose Zach Moss. Others chose Jonathan Taylor. We were both, it was a push because they both touched it 13 times. And it's a shame because they really could have used that win. I had a bad day. I think the standings are going to be very different next uh uh, next week, um, snap rate the tiebreaker in that. Scenario? Maybe I hope so. I just could help listen, you out. I had I had a brutal day at. Oh, uh, no. Yeah, you should be very happy. I don't think I'm going to be in first anymore. Just a brutal day there. But as it relates to Zach Moss and Jonathan Taylor, I think that's the takeaway. We knew Jonathan Taylor's workload would increase. We know Jonathan Taylor is ultimately going to be, you know, the starting Colts running back. They paid him too much money. He's too talented. But the idea is, would Zach Moss continue to have value? And I think the answer is yes. I like the seven targets. I like the fact that he played 49% of snaps and 33% of the team's rushes went to Zach Moss. I thought he was effective, too. I mean, again, like he averaged three. Effective is, is relative here. He averaged three yards per carry, but Jonathan Taylor averaged 2.4. I mean, so he was more effective than Taylor against a tough Jacksonville run defense here. Gardner Minshew, they, they're going to – the stat I gave going into this game was that under Gardner Minshew in the three games where Gardner Minshew had played, they had averaged about 30 running back touches, and so they get 26 in this one, right? I mean, so they're going to want to be run heavy, and it's not going to be – with Gardner Minshew, you know, because he's not Anthony Richardson. By the way, we haven't, I don't know if we've discussed it on this show, but over the weekend news came out that there's a chance Anthony Richardson gets shut down for the year. We'll dive into that more tomorrow on the waiver wire show about, you know, Minshew and everything like that. But like, it's going to be Gardner Minshew for the foreseeable future and potentially the rest of the year here. Yeah, tough matchup coming up for the Colts. They play Cleveland this week, which is, I think, literally and then the New last matchup. Yeah, so that's not ideal either. So there'll be a lot of debate about, all right, is this the week it flips to Taylor finally and he starts to get 60 65% of the touches? I don't think it's really going to matter the next week in particular just because that Cleveland defense is so scary. Yeah, but None with six teams guys. on its bye, you're not going to have a you, choice. Yeah, you're literally going to you're gonna just have to have to start them and hope one of them falls into the end zone. Yep. That's what we're going to have to do. And Taylor did get some work in the receiving game. Yes, um, which was which also nice. 546 caught the 40-yarder. Yeah. Through the air, Michael Pittman, the most effective Colts wide receiver. He gets 14 targets. He catches nine of them for 109 yards. It was good to see Gardner Minshew 
lean on Michael Pittman a bit in this game. Yeah, he's always going to be their wide receiver one. I think the interesting thing is a guy that we've talked up, and it doesn't show up in the box score a ton, just five for 21 for Josh Down, but eight targets. Eight targets. And again, in games coming up where, you know, I could see he's got Cleveland and then he's got the Saints. The Saints struggle against slot, especially because Lattimore always locks down the outs. I'm assuming yep. Lattimore will travel with Pittman. So I bet you not next week, but two weeks from now is sort of Josh Downs' breakout game uh, against the Saints. It gets a little bit easier after that as they play Carolina and the Patriots are the next two games for, uh, for the Colts after those two. But, um, yeah, I mean, Michael Pittman's a top 15 wide receiver, just massive volume with a quarterback that can get him the ball. Our final game here, the Rams take care of business against Arizona, kind of on the back of Kyron Williams, who had 20 carries, 158 yards, and a touchdown. He did hurt his ankle in the final minutes of the game, so we'll keep an eye on that throughout the week. But big yeah. day for Kyron. Well, by the way, and also news just before we went on air that apparently uh, Ronnie Rivers, who's been Kyron Williams' backup, dealing with a PCL. So there's a chance that the Rams are down to their third string running back. And trade so, for Cam Akers. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they <laughs> should do. They should trade for Cam Akers. It would be helpful to Simple have him there. Plus. So, again, lots to, tomorrow will be a busy show for us here on the happy hour. Um, in the meantime, yeah, they, Kyron Williams did have a monster game. Started slow, but then game script worked in their favor. They got up big, and he was able to just have a monster second half. 82% of the team snaps in week six. He's now had at least 80% of the snaps in four of the past five weeks. 20 for 158 and a touchdown. He's averaging over 25 fantasy points per game when he gets at least 20 touches a season. Like, again, it's crazy. You know, it's sort of like volume begets opportunity. It's a good offense. He's been in scoring position. Uh, look, on their first drive in the second half, the Rams ran the ball nine times just in that first drive. Like, again, hopefully he's okay. It was one of the reasons why in pregame we said pick up Ronnie Rivers because just the Kyron Williams size doesn't feel like he's built to take this kind of workload. Of course, then Ronnie Rivers gets hurt, like in theory it worked. But, um, yeah, I mean, hopefully he's healthy and you'd love him this week against Pittsburgh. Like, he's a locked-in RB1 as long as he's out there healthy. Yep. Connor, uh, given the McCaffrey injury, is there any player you'd want more in fantasy the rest of the season than Cooper Cup? Ooh, that's a good question. I think he might be number one at this I, point because Tyreek is playing like 65, 70 It's him or Tyreek. But you, yeah. I, it is interesting how the Dolphins are managing him. I think yeah. they under, either he's fighting something, which it seems like he has at times, or they're just being really cautious because they're constantly playing with a double-digit lead. I, it might be Cooper Cup. I mean, you look at yesterday, only nine targets, but he catches seven of them for 148 yards and a touchdown in a game where Puka Nakua was fine. It's just this is Cooper Cup's offense and always will be Cooper Cup's offense. Yeah, I mean, that's the big story is Nakua having the bad day with just 6.6 .6 fantasy points. But the positives, as you see it there on your screen, he still had a 33% target share, right? You know, I mean, yes, season lows in targets and receiving yards. He ran under 30 routes. But again, we just talked about it. They got up big in this game. They didn't need to throw that much. They ran significantly in the second half. I, I will just tell you this. I'm just going to make an announcement to anyone that plays in a league with me, and I'm in 17. In any one of those 17 leagues where I do not have Puka Nakua, I have him in about half of those oh. leagues. If you would like to trade me Puka Nakua, I'm buying. I'm interested. Send me an offer. I'm down. I will. I don't think you can, quote, buy low on Puka Nakua, but I think his value is as, is at as low as it will get after, quote, one bad game. Like, he's... He's still going to be a superstar. The thing is, too, is that he was this close to catching a touchdown pass on a third down play. If he just yeah. gets that, which he will most of the time, then he's 5-37 to 37 on the touchdown, which isn't a great day, but it's fine. It's fine. And, right. uh, I mean, Niku will be fine. The targets I, are still there. By the way, I'm being told in my ear that in our league, our show league, mm. where, again, I like I, I, I sent Dan in Mexico back to Mexico. Yeah, yeah. He was <laughs> he he's Dan in Mexico because yeah. he, he drafted – he was on vacation in Mexico and drafted his team. Yeah. So his team is Dan from Mexico, but he li – Dan in Mexico, but he lives here in Stanford. But I destroyed him in such a way that <laughs> I feel like he may need to get his visa and head back out. Um, He's actually in uh, witness protection. He's doing like the Saul Goodman. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, what I did to him should, should be illegal in most states. Uh, <laughs> but I'm told that in our league, in our show league, Michael Smith has uh, Puka Naku on his yeah. team. So I take it back. Just because, have you ever tried to make a trade with Michael? <laughs> no, we talk about it's Dynasty a lot, though. It's so exhausting. I, I love Michael. I, I played in fantasy leagues with him for probably 12 years. Yeah. I love Michael. It's a talking trade with him, and he if he were here, he would completely own this. It is exhausting. 
Well, Puka Nakua is on I can't the throw table for Michael. You just got to trade him Josh Allen and Stefan mm. Diggs and then I, get Nakua. No, and here's what this is what will happen. I'll tell you right now. No, even if you're like, okay, <laughs> fine, I'll give you Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs. He's like, I can give you Puka, right? All right, fine. You've, you've arrived there after yeah. two hours. <laughs> then an hour later, he'd be like, you know, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I, instead of Diggs, I want Cup. And you're like, God, we agreed on Allen and Diggs. Yeah. And then he, also further down, then you and he also then wants to trade Keaton Mitchell for Amari De Mercado. So right, the kind of second exactly. Aspect of you know. have, it, it's exo- I I encourage both of you to try to <laughs> trade with my. It's exhausting. I might call. Uh, he has Brees Hall. I might give him a call for Brees Hall today. Give it a call. Just, I a call. just want this the experience. I don't I'm want him to make a trade. You. I'm telling you, yeah. I love the man, but exhausting. The only other thing from this game, guys, and Matthew, you said the Rams controlled much of this game. They dominated the second half. The Cardinals' backfield, a, a lot of different names going on here. Keontae Ingram gets 10 carries for 40 yards. Damian Williams gets eight carries for 36 yards, almost an identical stat line. And then Imari DiMercato has two carries for 11 yards. I mean, let's call it what this is. This backfield is an absolute disaster when James Conner is hurt. It's it's a committee. It didn't do well. By the way, the leading rusher on Arizona was Josh Dobbs, who had 47 yards rushing himself. Uh, Damian Williams, former Kansas City Chief great Damian Williams. Out of nowhere. Former uh, New Orleans Saint, not so great. Uh, like Been all over, but yeah, out of nowhere, Damian Williams actually um, – Gets 16% of the snaps and 27% of the team rushes. It's his first game since week one of the 2022 season. Remember, he was with Atlanta back then. He's been he's he's kicked around the league quite a bit. I weirdly think Damian Williams is like if you know I mean like I don't know like this is what we said on pregame. This is what we said last week. It's what I continue to say is like ideally you don't want any part of this offense. Uh, they play at Seattle next week, which isn't a great mat isn't a, a matchup that really worries you. Actually, I don't think that's right. Hang on. Let me see who they play next week. They play um, at Seattle. Do they do play at, at Seattle? Okay. So, um, Never doubt the notes, Matthew. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> the notes have something else in here that I know is wrong. <laughs> so, I know what you're looking at. Uh, um, so, uh, anyway, okay. So, they play at Seattle next week, but ideally it's a situation. You may not be able to avoid it because, again, six teams on, white, it, on bye. It's a bye Mageddon. Plus, we've got all these running back injuries. We haven't even got to David Montgomery yet. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but, yeah, it's – Ideally, a situation to avoid. I mean, I will say this. Keontae Ingram, in his first game off of injury, 10 for 40, 2 for 11 in the passing game. So 12 touches, and he got 36% of the snaps, including 67% of the rushes in the red zone. So it feels like him as well. Like, this should have been, given the game script, this should have been an Amari DiMaccardo game, and it wasn't. Yes, indeed. And it feels like the Cardinals are kind of, becoming themselves and the team that they were always supposed to be after some friskiness. You know, it's funny. They're, like, I don't think it's going to happen, but there's a real chance the Cowboys win the Super Bowl this year. It's only like plus 1,200. And there's a chance the Cardinals only have one win this year, and it'll be blowing yeah, out the Cowboys. Blowing out the Cowboys, <laughs> yeah. Not even a close game. All right, let's get into the notable injuries before we get to break. This was all from Sunday. Christian McCaffrey, we already discussed. Justin Fields hurts his hand. We'll keep an eye on all of these throughout the week. Dave Montgomery's the big one here, right, Matthew? Yeah. I mean... This could be somewhat significant. It could be a multi-week injury with a rib injury. And the bottom line is, I mean, the way they run Montgomery, he's bound to get banged up. So they're at Baltimore this week, then home to Las Vegas, which is probably not a game they're that worried about, and then the bye. I wonder if they basically, given they're 5-1, and one, they have Super Bowl aspirations, they need Dave Montgomery to be a big part of this game. Without knowing the extent of the injury, there have been some reports out there that he's going to, quote, miss some time. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean two practices? That means a month. Like, very wide range of outcomes, but I'm just sort of trying to think here a little bit. Doesn't feel like he's playing this week at Baltimore. The, you know, feels like that's done. And so then you're like, he's got Vegas at home and then a bye. Maybe they get uh, Jameer Gibbs back this week as well. I think that'll be telling. So Craig Reynolds will be somebody we talk about tomorrow on the show. Uh, but that one's a tough one. The other ones that are interesting to me are, so a lot of quarterbacks, a lot of quarterbacks that they don't really have a lot of fantasy value, Baker Mayfield, Ryan Tannehill, but just the going to the backups there would hurt the value of the Chris Godwins, the Mike Evans, the DeAndre Hopkins uh, of the world. You know, we saw the Malik Willis experience yesterday, um, which, you know, <laughs> wasn't great. Wasn't great. Um, is one way to put it. The last one I think that's really important there, the one quarterback that is fantasy relevant, Justin Fields, mm. it's a thumb. I, he dislocated the thumb. Feels like you need that to throw. Mm, I don't know. Five as well. Uh-huh. They're one and five. 
they don't need to win this season. In fact, they may need to Not lose. Not want to. <laughs> might be uh, Tyson Bajent time yes. in Chicago. Yes. Everybody's talking about Tyson, Tyson Bajent time. Yes. I think it's Bajent. Is it Bajent? 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 Yeah, it's your, when you do your I'm college you scouting, right now, does it, it not matter. go to Spencer uh, <laughs> University or wherever he's from? Shepard. Shepard, He's sorry. the all-time passing leader for Division Two, and his dad, world champion arm wrestler. Okay. Wow. Yes. There yes. you go. Yeah. Listen, I, listen, the kid was put in a tough situation. Yeah. I don't think he, he was fine. Like, there's been much worse quarterback play this year in the NFL, including in both Atlanta and Washington. So, uh, you know, uh, anyway. So, but, yes, it does feel like, as of right now, it feels like the Tyler Bajant show might be, uh, might be what we see on Sunday. All right. The toughest competition of the year is here. The biggest talents in men's rugby take the stage as 20 countries compete for 20 days of heart-pounding, hard-hitting action at the Rugby World Cup. Watch every match live on Peacock all the way through the final on October 28th, with games also available on CNBC. We're taking our first break when we're back. Weekend Warriors and Sunday Scaries. Mostert in the backfield. They Got give it. it to Mostert. Touchdown, his third of the afternoon. What a game for Raheem Mostert. It's really cool to watch. Um, the, the guy is hungry for every opportunity, um, and I think you see his will um, in the way he runs the ball. So, um, you know, down around the goal line, a lot of times uh, the perfect play doesn't exist, and it's uh, um, a battle of wills, and, and he's not a guy that a lot of people want to tackle. That was Dolphins head coach Mike McDaniel on Raheem Moster. What an experience, so Mike McDaniel. So good. It's, you know what? It's genuine. That's really him. I love it's it. Not, it's, not a, it's not a bit. It's not an act. It's, it's just, just him. Yeah. And He's that's awesome. why, uh, you know, one of the many reasons the Dolphins have had an incredible year. And Raheem Moster, it's a huge part of that. Yes, 17 sir. carries, 115 yards, two touchdowns, three catches. And a, he also caught a touchdown in this game. As it stands right now, Matthew, he is the top running back from the weekend across fantasy. Raheem must start for a reason. Second game this season with 20 touches. It's only uh, two such games in his career prior to this. And he was a monster, right? Three, uh, three touchdowns adds to his leading NFL 11 touchdowns from scrimmage this season. He's scored in five of the six games he's played so far this season. On the year, he's running back three in fantasy points per game, 23.2. Uh, look, they got, they got down 14. It was funny. They were they were 14 and a half point underdog. Uh, oh, they were 14 and a half point favorites heading into this game. They got down 14, so in essence they're down 28, 28 and a half, and they ended up covering. <laughs> they, 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 like, easily, thing, easily. The Panthers had a 14 nothing lead. Later in the game, got an interception return touchdown. Yeah, still didn't come close to covering. It's, <laughs> it's insane. It is insane. Even up, uh, even down 14 nothing, the Dolphins were like minus 160 oh money God, line favorites because it was just it felt inevitable they were going to come back, and and so they did. Yeah, I mean, so again, we'll see whether Jeff Wilson Jr. gets activated this week and whether he, he continues to cut into the workload. But even like again, so obviously this game helps a lot, but. Raheem Mostert is a, you know, top 12-ish running back, even even in a timeshare with Jeff Wilson Jr. or when, when Devon A. Chan comes, uh, comes back. So, listen, you think about Raheem Mostert, you know, on the other uh, side of 30. Adam Thielen, who we're going to talk about. Travis Kelsey, like, let's hear it for the old guys helping you win fantasy. That's been good. Raheem Mostert is RB2 in fantasy this season. Yeah. That includes three weeks of... Uh, his running back partner, Devin H. Chan, being the best player in football. So, yeah. uh, incredible season for Raheem Mostert. No real reason that he should slow down for the next few weeks either. It's always staying healthy for Raheem Mostert. Yeah. And so far, so good. Jay, a massive day for Matthews rider, Diamond Ross St. Brown. He's wide receiver one coming out of the weekend. Catches 12 15 targets, 124 yards, and the touchdown in a game where Jared Goff looked awesome. In he this did game. look awesome. Amazing block here oh, from Craig Reynolds to get Pale Craig. Ra. Into the end zone. I think this is a really good sign for Detroit's offense going forward. The fact that, look, I understand Tampa Bay in October isn't Buffalo in December, but Goff outdoors has been a problem his entire career. And the fact that he was able to have that type of game. And also, I think it bodes well for the Detroit pass catchers if, you know, Dave Montgomery's going to miss some time, Jimmy yes. Gibbs is banged up. All these pass catchers are going to get work, mainly Monra, but also Jameson Williams, Matthew. 
Yeah, no, no question at all. D Jameson Williams had like an absolutely brilliant catch uh, in this particular game as well for a touchdown. It was nice to nice to see that as well. Um, and to your point about Amon Ross, St. Brown, right? They're they're going to be without their run. Game. They're going to have to be more pass heavy in their upcoming schedules. We talked about they're at Baltimore, then home to Vegas, then they've got the bye, then they're at the Chargers. So the schedule lays out pretty nicely for them. You're not really scared about. Baltimore as well. Sam Laporta, 11 targets in this game, but just four for 36. He was disappointing somewhat, but given the fact that he was a little bit banged up coming into the game, not uh, not surprising. But this is his first game back. Amon Ra from injury. Great to see him picking up right where he left off. Locked in RB uh, wide receiver one. Big night on Sunday Night Football for Stephon Diggs, who has yet another 100-yard game. That's his fourth in a row. He's targeted 16 times. It feels like every offseason, Matthew, we have this conversation of the Bills have finally found that number two. They, they draft Kincaid. Gabe Davis has his moments. At the end of the day, the volume for Stephon Diggs when Josh Allen is under center, which is always, is just astronomical. Look, Josh Allen did not play well last night. He didn't. No. You know, credit the – and yet, still, Stephon Diggs had his fourth straight 100-yard game. He's on pace – for 139 receptions this year he's like it's weird we you know we talk about some of these other guys Stefan Diggs very quietly is having a monster fantasy season he's just been nothing short of terrific as we enter Monday Night Football he's the wide receiver seven on the year he couldn't get into the end zone I mean backup tight end and Deontay Hardy what are you gonna do <laughs> but um yeah I mean None of this is, is surprising. Diggsies is the man. To be fair. Friend of the podcast, Stefan Diggs. Friend of the podcast. The Deontay Hardy touchdown was basically Stefan Diggs because four defensive players followed him across right. formation. Fortunately, I don't get credit for that in fantasy. But, I mean, Diggs, he's just not quite – he's just not as fast as Tyreek Hill or Jamar Chase, so he's not as explosive. He doesn't have the same 70-yard touchdown runs that the Cheetah has, but he's just locked and loaded. The target share isn't going anywhere. It will get colder in Buffalo. His production tails off in the second half of the season, but he's going to be a top-five wide receiver. You know who's also not very fast is Adam Thielen at this point of his career, and it doesn't matter. He catches 11 to 13 targets for 115 yards and a touchdown. And, Jay, I think most importantly – Yes, mostly in the first half, but Bryce Young looked like the guy they thought they were getting when the Panthers came out of the tunnel of this game. Yeah, and sneakily, he Bryce Young looked better against the Lions as well in the previous week where he was able to put up yards, even if it was mostly in garbage time. And Adam Thielen, to me, this is the most shocking thing in fantasy this year. Adam Thielen is wide receiver three right now. The only two guys in front of him are Tyreek Hill and Stephon Diggs. He's narrowly in front of Jamar Chase, AJ Brown. Like, it's completely insane what he's doing. And you would just say that it's unsustainable because how could it not be unsustainable? But at the same time, I think that if he stays healthy, he's going to be a top 12, 15 wide receiver going forward on this well, volume. That's the, only, that's the only question is can he stay healthy, right? I mean, because again, the question is always like when somebody has success, it's always like, okay, why did this happen and is it repeatable? And so in the case of like Miami, it is repeatable, right? Because we've just seen how fast those guys are, how well he schemes the offense. Tyreek Hill is insanely fast. Well, in the sense of Adam Thielen, like, it's a bad defense. They're constantly going to be in negative game script. They're constantly going to be throwing, and they look to Adam Thielen quite a bit, right? And so, and he's also, he plays the slot where often there's softer coverage as well. He's had 10 receptions and 100 receiving yards in three of the past four games, right? Since the second week of the season, he's the second best wide receiver in fantasy. Fifth straight game with 15 or more fantasy points. He's had 20 or more in four of those games. Like, this is, I, it is all sustainable because of, He's talented. They throw it a lot. Bryce Young is sort of locked in on him. Bryce Young feels like kind of a first-read quarterback at this point uh, of his career. And they're going to be a negative game script all the time. Absolutely. All right, the next one here, Drake London in a game, guys, where we got to see what it's like when Desmond Ritter, uh, the training wheels are taken off a little bit, and it yeah. got ugly at times. Ritter threw ooh, three ooh, picks ooh. in this game. He, he had 40. Where's Lawrence? He'll be here so Wednesday. Call Lawrence. He will be here. It, Ritter had 47 attempts in this game. And one of the biggest beneficiaries of that was Drake London, who gets 12 targets and gets 125 yards out of those targets. All right. So <laughs> that was the pickup line on Friday, wasn't yeah. it? Drake London? Yeah. Over 44 and a half. Well done. Yeah. yeah. Well done. Triple it. Um, Triple it. Here's what I would say. <laughs> Here's what I would say Almost. is that, um, and I think I bought it. I think I went home with you for yeah, the Drake. Yeah. Because well, you go I, home with me a lot. I forget what the cause, whether it's, it's Drake it's London some, or for other sometimes it's just your, organic your, reasons. Yeah, sometimes it's just your, uh, your boyish good looks. Um, uh, and, you know, a couple of two margaritas. Uh, here's the only concern. So the positives are, here's the positives. Like, they, Desmond Ritter was aggressive. Like, he made some boneheaded mistakes here. Um, but 
he was aggressive. He threw the ball. It was a great game for both Drake London and Kyle Pitts. Finally, free Kyle Pitts, right? Finally did it, right? And so, um, and their upcoming schedule lends them lends itself to that. They're at Tampa Bay. They're at Tennessee. Home to Minnesota. At Arizona. All defenses that you can throw on. All teams with secondaries that have struggled so far this year, similar to the last two games. The concern is that they lost this game. Like Arthur Smith opened up the playbook, they threw a ton, and it didn't work. So you know what he's thinking. Yeah, I'm never, never again. throwing again. The Alamo. Yeah, for Arthur exactly. Smith, you know what this offense needs is even more Tyler Algier. That's what we need. More Tyler Algier. I, I, don't get me started. The Drake London back-to-back -back games now with six for 75. Fifth straight game with at least six plus targets. He had a 23% target share over that time frame. I think he is good enough that I think he can sort of like he's now back into the wide receiver range where you drafted him. You feel good about this. Also on the road at Tampa Bay. Back-to-back -back games with 14 or more fantasy points for Kyle Pitts here as well. Even though John o. Smith got his as well, it was nice to see Kyle Pitts score a touchdown on American soil. God bless that. God bless America. God bless America. Um, I'm buying it more than I'm not, guys. Yeah. I mean, I was, just so. when you thought you were out. I just, I, Ritter was so bad in this game. Like, Washington's defense isn't good. And yet, you know, they force a number of turnovers in this game, Jay. Yeah, it wasn't great from Desmond Ritter from a football perspective. But fantasy-wise, I think you take a lot of heart from this week and last week. Last week when he was actually good because he has shown that he can support these guys who are clearly uh, super talented. And Drake London's averaging over eight targets per game the past five weeks. And he had similar stats at the end of last year. Like, he's just going to get volume. I, I'm, and he's good. I'm less concerned about Drake London than I am t uh, Kyle Pitts. Yeah. I don't know that we're fully out of the woods with Kyle Pitts, but oh, the bar the is so low to be a productive tight end in fantasy. Like, I'm willing to like, all right. Yeah, maybe, you know? Yeah, so there we go. Uh, yeah, and, and it'll, by the way, if Tampa Bay, if they don't have Baker Mayfield, well, we'll talk about that game moving up, but I'm just, I'm nervous that they won't be in the same game script where they're throwing as much against the Buccaneers. Yep. All I'm saying. Let's jump into the Sunday scaries, and we'll kick it off with DeAndre Hopkins, who's targeted five times, only one catch for 20 yards. And I think if Ryan Tannehill is out for any extended period of time, you have to be worried, Matthew, of how startable DeAndre Hopkins could be with Malik Willis playing quarterback. A thousand percent. He's got 47 touchdowns on the season, zero touchdowns, and that's with Tannehill. Malik Willis, whatever he is, he's not as good as Ryan Tannehill at this stage of his career. They're on a bye this week, so that'll be helpful, but then he'll have Atlanta after the bye. Probably see a lot of A.J. Terrell. Yeah, you got to be nervous if you have Hopkins on your team. Arthur Smith revenge game, too. Oh, Scar yeah. Scary spot. How about that? Real terrifying spot. <laughs> Jay, what about T. Higgins? He catches only two of four targets for 20 yards. We were worried about T. Higgins uh, suiting up for this game. It felt a little early, and the results kind of showed that. No team needs to buy more than the Bengals, and they get it this week. So I think they'll all be better coming out of it. Joe Burrow is not right at the moment. We thought he was after the Cardinals game, but the calf still clearly was ailing him a little bit. I think they'll be fine coming out of the bye. I was shocked given the fact that they have the bye next week and they really need this win. I thought I was shocked that T. Higgins was, in essence, used as a decoy, right? He played only 53% of the snaps. He was just out there as a decoy, and I didn't think that was going to be the case. I, I recommend starting him uh, on Fantasy Football pregame. I'll just own that. Bad call by me. I just didn't think with the bye the following week, like, why are you going to risk this guy with a rib injury out there? And that's what they ended up doing. Last one here for me, guys, just in terms of Sunday scares, is Rashad White. Like, again, season low 10 touches. He's averaging 3.3 yards per carry this year. He hasn't been great all year long, but you've been banking on the volume. And in this game, Jay, he didn't get the volume. No, he got nothing. That team did not look good at all. Uh, NFC South is brutal. And if Baker Mayfield's going to miss any time, That's then you, feel, you don't feel great about any part of the offense. We'll take one more break. When we're back, we're bringing you our Monday Night Football preview with our best bets. DraftKings Sportsbook is an official sports betting partner of the NFL. New customers can bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. Download the app and use promo code BERRY when you sign up. DraftKings Sportsbook, the crown is yours. All right, let's take a look at our most bet Monday night football props courtesy of our friends at DraftKings for what we expect to be a highly offensive powered game between the Chargers and the Cowboys. Tony Pollard's rushing yards over at 68 and a half. That is number one on the market right now. CD Lamb's receiving yards over is number two at 71 and a half. Austin Eckler's back. Rushing yards is set at 48 and a half. The public likes the over. CD Lamb alternate receiving yards of 100 plus. That's at plus 260 there. 
Jay, I think some people are liking your spicy bets on that one. <laughs> and our last one here, CD Lamb receptions over five and a half at number five. Jay, this is what the public likes, but what do you like? Well, firstly, I do like Ekelo over 48 and a half. To me, that's too low. I think he'll have a pretty good workload coming off uh, his timeout. Also, don't mind him. Uh, some of the alternates there as well. 90 plus is plus 550. But my best bet is Tony Pollard over 68 and a half mm -hmm. rushing yards, which the public likes as well. Cowboys just haven't played any normal games this year. That's right. Three of their games have been decided like 30 points. They had a 20 point win over the Jets. The only semi normal game that Pollard and the Cowboys have played was against the Cardinals, and he had 23 carries for 122 yards. I think this is going to be a more normal game because it's so close to pick, and Pollard will get a lot of work and go over 68 and a half. Yeah, look, I totally agree with you, right, by, on, the, on the Cowboys here, right? I mean, so uh, they got their butts kicked by San Francisco and Arizona. They beat the Patriots, the Giants, and the Jets. And they in, blew them in, out. It, it blew them out, but, like, the Jets in their first, you know, post Rodgers right. game, right? So they haven't played any normal games, and I don't know if they're any good. Like, we assume they're good, but their defense is somewhat beat up here as well. So I'm going to tell you something. Like, again, the Chargers have had two weeks to prepare for this game. Their game is at home. On Monday Night Football, they're going to have the crowd behind them. I know Cowboys travel well. You'll see a decent amount of Cowboys there. But give me the Chargers plus one and a half. I think the Chargers are winning this outright. So I even like them on the money line. But certainly also I'll take the points if you're going to give them to me. And I like the under on this as well. I think this is going to be more of a defensive struggle. I'm not convinced the Cowboys offense is any good. Dak has not looked terrible. Again, Staley, Brandon Staley has had two weeks to prepare for this matchup. And then I'll just give you one other player prop. Give me Michael Gallup over 36 and a half. Like he's hit this number two of the last three. He's had at least five targets in five and, and three straight games as well. And, and I just, I feel like um, I, the only game he didn't hit in the last three as he started to ramp up more snaps was the San Francisco blowout game. Yep. But the Chargers are last in the NFL in passing yards allowed. I think they'll be focused on stopping my guy eights. So Gallup gets over 36 and a half receiving yards. A lot of storylines in this one, fellas, and I'm going to go for each team to score a touchdown in each half. Just one touchdown from each team in each half. Kellen Moore, he's going to be ready to roll with this Chargers offense against a good Cowboys defense, but they do have some holes. Sure. And then the bottom line is Dallas has to get it going against a Chargers defense that has shown almost nothing this year, Jay. Yep. This is a big game for Dak Prescott. This is referendum Huge. time on Dak Prescott. Yes, if they it is. lose this game, then all of a sudden you can kiss the one seed goodbye, winning the division probably good by so this is a massive game for Dak and also a massive game for the Chargers they lose this to two and three AFC West basically gone at that point yeah I mean a thousand percent it's actually going to be a fascinating game really really interesting made even better by betting that's you know listen at, <laughs> at, at DraftKings <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at DraftKings where you can use the promo code Barry uh yeah, I just I think it's here's here's what I'm going to say is, is that it's a referendum on two coaches, right? Both McCarthy and Brandon Staley are on the hot seat as well. To your point, also is Dak. I'm betting on the Chargers here. There you go. Listen, it's closing time, which means you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Good luck tonight for Jay and Connor. I'm Matthew Berry. Congrats, the Jets. Good job, guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Peace out. Hey, it's Matthew Berry from NBCSports.com and RotorWorld.com, and I want to thank you so much for watching whatever it is you just watched, or if nothing else, being too lazy to click out of the autoplay after this video started, after whatever it is you actually wanted to watch finished. But now that you're here, I'd like to take a moment here to ask you respectfully, respectfully now, okay, I'm asking you respectfully to subscribe to the NFL on NBC YouTube channel. You'll get the latest Roto World fantasy news headlines, all sorts of great shows, including my own Fantasy Football Happy Hour. So go subscribe now. Again, I'm asking respectfully.